Harvey family and welcome to worship today. We're thrilled to be able to connect with you in this way. Today we're going to worship in spirit and in truth. We're going to engage our minds and our hearts. And today, later in the service, we're going to be in the book of Genesis. And we're going to be looking in uh, Genesis chapter number 6 at the life of Isaac. So you can get your Bible and you can get ready for that. Today i got a couple of treats for you. Not only are you going to see somebody who is, made, is making a profession of faith, they got saved, and we're going to be baptizing them in the, in the, in the days to come. We want you to be able to see that and celebrate with that. But we also want you to worship in a way that today we want you to have part a party in what we did last week. Last week was the wrap-up service for our Disciple Now weekend, and we were privileged because our middle school band led Sunday morning worship for us, and I'm telling you, they were incredible. So we want you to worship uh, that way with us today. And uh, we're going we're gonna to trust the Lord for a great day, and we're going to pray that He moves in our hearts today. So let's pray and let's get started. Father, we love you and we thank you for your love for us. We pray that as we begin worship today, that our minds and our hearts and our, our all, our everything would engage with you today. We want to sing in a way that celebrates you. We want to open the scripture in a way we, we listen for what you have for us. And then, Father, we want to obey in a way that says we, we've accepted you as king and you get to call the shots in our lives. Father, I pray that you bless this time of worship. Even Father, even though it's outside the room and it may be in a living room or a dorm room or, or wherever, that Father, it is, as, it is worship as, as, as any other place. Help us to really worship today. We honor you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's get to it. Good morning, church family. It's right after our 9 o'clock service this morning. Uh, we want to introduce you to Macy Timms. Uh, just a few days ago, Macy gave her heart to Jesus, and she got saved. And uh, she's making that public this morning. She wants you to know. And we're talking about baptism with her. So as we prepare for that day, why don't you, uh, why don't you encourage her and pray for her? And let's thank the Lord what he's done in her life. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has a great peace. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has a great
Every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. 
can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. All right. Take your Bible. Let's turn together. Let's begin our time in the scriptures. We're in Genesis chapter number 26. Genesis chapter number 26. In our Bible readings over the last couple of weeks, we've been progressing through the book of beginnings in the Bible. That's what the word Genesis means. It literally means in the beginning. And in our podcasts earlier throughout the week, we kind of encountered the concept of what's called the meta narrative. That's just a just kind of a unique way of saying that in the Bible, the scriptures are going to tell us a lot of different stories throughout all the Bible. Over 66 books from cover to cover, there's going to be a lot of information that's given. But the idea of the meta narrative is that even though you have all of these smaller individual pieces, they're all working together to tell one big, giant, cohesive story. That's why when you're reading Genesis, the initial chapters of them are going to cover such large blocks of time. They tell us that in those initial in those initial chapters, they're going to cover about an average of 276 years per chapter. Now, why is that? The reason it kind of goes like that is because it's telling us the big picture and not all the details of the small picture. See, the goal of reading through our Bible is not to know every single detail of every single event that happened in every single life. That's not the goal. The goal is to know God. Now, I told you a couple of weeks ago that, that for me, I always learn better with the use of stories rather than with the use of manuals. And so I enjoy the book of Genesis for that reason. God tells us the big story in the Bible by telling us the smaller stories of everyday people. Now, here's what you're going to find as you keep reading. You're going to find that at, from this point on, you'll, you'll see a series of very true stories of actual men and women who are just like us. They're loved, they're used, and they're rescued by God. In some of those stories, the information, the highlight, the spotlight will hit somebody's life for just a moment. It's going to give you a slice of a day or a slice of a period of life, a season or a moment. But in other moments, the information is going to kind of dwell there and cover a thread from the moment somebody is born to the moment they die. Here's what you're going to find. Whether you're with a character for 14 chapters or for 14 verses, Characters in the scripture are going to come and they're going to go, but God is always going to remain constant. God is always going to be the same. This month, our attention in the book of Genesis has been on the life of Isaac. Now, Isaac in the Bible is a relatively minor character in the book of Genesis. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 26, this is the only pure chapter just about him in all of the Bible. Uh, he, is, he is rarely discussed. As a matter of fact, this is why you will hear studies on Abraham or the life of Jacob or the life of Joseph. But rarely do you camp out much in the life of Isaac. Everyone seems to know things about him, but pretty much all that we know really is tied to how he interacts with other people. Every moment of his life seems to be just part of somebody else's story. And that may be some of the charm. He's a guy who is known, like maybe many of us, he's known purely by a relationship. He is somebody's son. He is somebody's father. He is somebody's grandfather. He is somebody's daddy. He is somebody's husband. So his life is not really just about him standing in the spotlight. Really, his life is tied to the other lives of the people that he loves the most. And what we find for Isaac, some of his best moments and some of his worst moments are always at home. Maybe many of us can relate to it. Maybe it is that many of us have stories wrapped up with the same kind of relationships, the same kind of people, and our families often see our best days and they see our worst days. Let me ask you this. You ever had a day where you felt like your family, as much as you love them, your family got the leftovers of your day? Maybe you blew up and now you're frustrated and you're feeling guilty because you showed your family in a moment of I was tired or I was frustrated or I had a long day. My family got to see a side of me that I would never let a stranger see. But my family got the brunt of that attack. And so, and so now you're, you're feeling like your family, who you love most, is actually getting uh, the leftover scraps or, or maybe even the worst. That's why I think that even though we don't know a whole lot about Isaac, 
I think we can at least sympathize with where he's coming from. Now, I want to look at one of his stories, but I want to, I want to warn you, this is not Isaac's best day. And so we're going to begin reading in Genesis chapter 26. I'm going to start in verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. And there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt, but live in the land which I shall, which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of the heavens. And I will give to your descendants all of these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, my laws, so Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And the men of the place asked about his wife. And he said, oh, well, she is, she's my sister. For he was afraid to say that she's my wife, because he thought, lest the men of the place kill me for Rebekah, for she was beautiful to behold. Now it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through the window and he saw there Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Quite obviously, she is your wife, so how could you say she is my sister? And so Isaac said to him, Because I said, Lest I die on her account. And Abimelech said, What is this that you have done to us? One of the people might have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt on us all. So Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Then Isaac sowed in the land, and he reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Now when you read through the book of Genesis from chapter to chapter, what you're going to find is uh, the way we've been reading this, you're going to come across some really, really weird and awkward stories. So much so that the decisions that you're going to see a lot of these heroes of faith make are stories that maybe we didn't cover when we were kids in Sunday school class. We kind of skipped these moments. But now we're reading through them and we're, we're, we're seeing this stuff in the Bible and we're going, hold on, I thought that these were God's people. I thought that these were, these were God's chosen patriarchs. I thought that God was doing something through them and using them because they were so faithful to God. But what you're finding is these people are going to lie. They're going to cheat. They're going to steal. They're going to be really bad parents, really bad husbands, really bad wives. And it's going to feel odd. It's going to feel awkward. It's going to feel maybe a little bit disappointing to see these are the people that the Bible is about. But then when you do those things, I tell you what you're going to find. You're going to find great comfort in the fact that as God kept loving them, God will also keep loving you, and you'll start to kind of get it. Now, what you're going to eventually come to appreciate is that no matter what happens when you're reading these stories, the stories always seem to keep going. Why? Because God, He made us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. God knows all things. He pieces all of life together. And so God is never going to be intimidated by the messy nature of our lives. As a matter of fact, He's not going to cut us off when we sin. He's not going to abandon us. He's not going to forsake us. He's not going to move us off to the side and move on somewhere else. When we're reading these stories, what we're, what we're coming to find out about the character of God is that God, while He may discipline us, he will never abandon us. Now I want you to look today at, at the lies we see in this story. Because this is really a story about a man of God who is very comfortable telling lies. Now it ought not be that way, certainly. But it could be that as we read this story, we find that sometimes the easiest place to tell lies, accept lies, believe lies, and know something is a lie, but maybe want to believe that is true, Maybe the easiest place to do that is actually at home. And that's what makes this kind of scary. Look back in verse number one. It really sets up the storyline. It says, And there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of Philistines, in Gerar. So uh, this event happens. Chapter 26 in its entirety. This event happens after two major life-changing moments in, in Isaac's kind of whole story. The first one is that Isaac's father, Abraham, who we know well, we've studied, we've heard about probably all the days since we've been in church life. Abraham has just died. We also find that in the, in the same chapter where it's telling us about the, the, the death of Abraham, it's also telling us that Isaac becomes a father. 
He becomes the father to maybe the first two twins that, that are ever in history, certainly the first two twins that are in the Bible. So Isaac is in a position now he's never been in his life. He's now, for the first time in his life, he's without his daddy, who daddy probably always took care of these kind of big decisions in his life. And now he is a daddy himself, and he's responsible for people besides himself. And this is his first major family decision when things have really gotten in trouble. Now, uh, at this point, then, you see that there is a famine in the land. Now, let me give you a little insight into this, because this won't be the last time you find this in your Bible. Anytime you see a section of the scripture where it begins the story by saying, and there was a famine in the land, it's usually not just literal, the fact that there was a shortage of food in the land, it's also typically very symbolic of what's going on probably in the hearts of the people in the story. And so you, you've got this, it's symbolic that when you, you read through something like this, you're seeing that probably the spiritual thing is, as people are dealing with a scarcity of food, maybe the people in the story are connecting. This was a very dry season when a person or a people are distant from God, certainly more than they ever need to be, and it's starting to show. This is the context where Isaac picks up his family. He moves 75 miles to the northeast for what he thinks is a better life. But here's the problem. That's where his trouble starts. Can I just kind of give you a, uh, a, a life lesson here, a rule of thumb, that you may want to highlight right in the margins of your Bible? If this, is a, if this moment is not just a literal famine, certainly it is a literal famine. They were, there was scarcity of food. But if it's going deeper than that and maybe showing that Isaac, now dealing with a crisis of decision, how in the world do I protect this family? They're now my responsibilities, and I'm doing it without my mentor, my daddy, who has always really handled this stuff for me. And he's in this moment. He, he probably it feels like uh, the ground underneath his, his feet for the first time in his life is very, very unstable. And i tell you what he does. He makes the mistake of making a major life decision in the midst of that turbulent kind of famine. The rule of thumb is never make a move in your life when you're in a famine or your heart is in a dry season, an empty spiritual tank. Because when you make decisions in dry seasons in your walk with God, let me just tell you, you are typically going to make very poor decisions. Look in verse number 2. It says this, it says, Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt, but live in the land of which I shall tell you. Now this is a really interesting detail. Most of us would just kind of read this and, and pass on through, but the way we've been reading, we're starting, to, we're starting to recognize not just places, but also people. And so in this story, we're also now recognizing a similar event that's happened earlier. Years before this event, there was another famine. And the scripture in verse number one says it, this was the one besides the one that happened in the days of Abraham. So it's, it's admitting there's a connection here. So during this time of famine, Abraham, his daddy, during his day of famine, he had, he had run to Egypt whenever he was in trouble. He had gone to Egypt to try to find food. And that's where he fell into sin. You know what Abraham's sin was? Abraham's sin was that whenever he got to Egypt, he looked over at his wife and he noticed that his wife Sarah, although very old at this point, she was a good looking woman. And here's what Abraham thought. Abraham thought, if I move into Egypt and to take care of my family and the people of Egypt see my wife, they're going to want to have her for themselves. They're going to kill me so that they can have her. So do you know what Abraham does? Here's, here's was his solution. Abraham decides, I'm going to tell a lie. I'm going to tell everybody. I'm going to take myself out of being a, an obstacle for these people. I'm going to tell everybody that she's not my wife. She's actually my sister. And that's exactly what we find Isaac doing here. Can I tell you something I've told you dozens and dozens of times now? That sometimes in our life what we're going to find is the sins that we dip our toes in, the sins that we dabble in, our children will become experts at. Why? Because they will just improve on what we've already taught them. It's a very dangerous scenario what you see here, and it's quite convicting if you have children of your own and you go, man, I'm looking around at my life and the things that I'm struggling with, and I'm wondering what kind of example am I setting for my kids? The other piece to this is that years uh, is that years later from this point, Isaac's sons will also have another famine in their generation. Do you know where they go to? They run to Egypt. What's interesting is that when they get there, they don't just fall into sin, they fall into slavery. 
And they're there for 400 years. Egypt in the Bible was never really a safe place to go. In the Bible, it always symbolizes worldliness and sin and lack of faith. And God seems to be yelling at Isaac here, attempting to kind of break the cycle. He's saying, Isaac, whatever you do, don't do what daddy did. Don't run down to Egypt. And what you have in this story is God trying to get his servant not to fall into the same old kinds of traps he saw daddy fall into. Let me ask you this. You ever noticed how some families, regardless of the season of life or the generations, there are some families that kind of generationally fall into the same kind of patterns of the same old sins? Now, I'm not one that believes that just because a daddy does something, a kid will do it. But I'm telling you, if a daddy does something, there is every chance that a child can pick up on it. You ever seen a family where maybe substance abuse is a problem in that household and then it, it begins to be a trend in every generation that follows? You ever seen a, a situation where marriages in families are like revolving doors, generation to generation, with a revolving door of new exes and new wives and new husbands, so much so that as children age and they begin having families of their own, first sign of trouble, daddy got divorced, mama got divorced, they ran around, she ran around, he ran around, and so now it just becomes natural. Well, sweetheart, you know, uh, it didn't work out for me either. Here's what y'all do. Here's what I did. And, and, and kids follow in that pattern. Can I tell you this? I think that sin is contagious. Now certainly everybody makes their own choices, but when the people we know the best, who we love the most, and who we respect their lives, listen, when they've done something, we kind of feel a sense of freedom to go, okay, well, this is just how it's done. You ever known somebody who maybe in a family where mama and daddy, they served Jesus, but they served Jesus as kind of a weekend addition to their lives. That was their Monday through Saturday kind of life, but they were going to be at church on Sunday morning for the most part, for the most of their lives. And, but then as, as the generations continue on, what you're figuring out is their kids never really start to serve Jesus any more than just a Sunday morning attendance either. And they, maybe then they begin to wonder, well, where did we go wrong? Well, what if what if you didn't go wrong in just how you raised them? What if you went wrong with the example you showed them by what you do? I wonder this. If you're a mom or your dad watching this morning, um, do you feel the great weight that says the sin I dabble in, my children may pick up and become experts at? Does that worry you at all? As a matter of fact, if you're a child and you're, you're watching this morning and, and you're looking at your parents and you're going, I'm noticing some things that, 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 that I, I'm starting to see maybe for the first time. Hey, this is not healthy. This is not right. Certainly, we don't want to sit in judgment of our parents and we, we, we don't want to dishonor them or disrespect them in any way, but we can choose to not follow in those ways. I think that what we're happening, what we're seeing here is what Abraham Lincoln said years ago. He said, you know, it's very hard to escape history. Greg Laurie said it like this. He said that our character isn't made in time of crisis. Our character is only exhibited in our times of crisis. No matter what role, I think ultimately at the end of the day, no matter what role we have in our home, whether we be dad or mom or grandma or grandpa or even child or grandchild, no matter what role we have in the home, can I tell you everybody in the home ends up bringing something to the table? Everybody ends up pushing their family in some direction. Let me also make this connection. I know that some of you may be watching this morning and you don't, you don't live with family. Maybe it is that you, you've got, uh, you, you're separated from family. You're living on your own, maybe for the first time, or maybe it's been like that for a long time. I don't know. Can I tell you this? I think that all of us have a connection with somebody, some group, some people in our lives, and we may not share genetics with them, but they are very much close like family. It could be like a college student who's moved out of mom and daddy's home and they're living on a, in a college dorm, and now they've got, they've got sweet mates or dorm mates or or neighbors right there in the dorm and where they may be separated from their actual home this new place has started to kind of develop a kinship there well that's like a surrogate family or maybe a young couple 
who's starting live and they've moved off for a job and they, they befriend several other young couples and, and, and those couples kind of become a surrogate family for the others. Or maybe a family who, 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 who invites in other families to be part of their circle and they become as close as kin. So just know, whether you share DNA or not with a group of people, I think all of us, we, we all have a family, we all have a tribe and whatever tribe we're part of, can I tell you this, whether you know it or not, all of us are influencers to somebody. And I'm just wondering this, if all of us are bringing something to the table to our family, what kind of influence are you having with your family? Certainly Abraham had influence over Isaac. Isaac had influence over Jacob. Jacob had influence over Joseph. And I can tell you this, you've got influence with somebody else. Look in verse number seven. And the men of the place asked about his wife, and he said, She is my sister, for he was afraid to say she is my wife, because he thought, lest the men of the place kill me for Rebecca, because she is beautiful to behold. Now, there's, there's really no easy way for us to connect our culture in 2021 to the, the difficulties and the dangers of the cultural situation here in the early days of the patriarchs. But at the very least, surely we can all agree of the dangers that exist in a culture that has a culture of lust or lacks restraint with sexual behavior. And maybe then maybe maybe on that level we go, okay, I can see how I can see how that would that would make things dangerous. One resource I found kind of described the situation like this. It said historically Isaac might have had to negotiate with his Philistine neighbors in order to camp so near to their tribe. And as a result, he might have been expected to provide a wife for someone else's harem. And if Rebecca, which is his wife, was the most beautiful and the most important woman in the group, she becomes the prime candidate out of respect in order to come become part of somebody else's camp. She would have been the most desirable candidate, and Isaac might have been killed if he refused to give her away. See, I don't pretend to know all the, the worries of Isaac here, but I do recognize the fact that Isaac is not, was not, and will not be the last person to run to the perceived safety of a lie when he thinks he's in danger. I know that this is a weird moment. And we probably got a whole lot of things we could say, but I'm also not sure that many of us are in a position to be the ones where we're ready to cast the first stone in judgment. Because after all, it may be that, that we've all got things that we're okay with people thinking or believing about us, even if they aren't necessarily true either. See, I think home may be the place where we're most willing to embrace lies because sometimes it's easier to pretend like everything's okay even when it's not. Maybe for a situation like this, you have to you have to ask yourself, do you or somebody you know, uh, are you like people who live in a large house and they want everybody to think that they're living large, doing well, extremely successful, they got it all figured out, but really and truly, they're so stressed out and deep in debt, it keeps them up at night and they're miserable about it. You want people to believe that your kids are okay? And they're good kids, and they're nice kids, and they make good grades, and they're hoping for a good scholarship, and you want everybody to think, listen, my kids are the best, and you want them to believe that. Uh, but what may be true is you toss and turn at night because when you look at your kids, although you remember them walking an aisle, maybe when they were seven, eight, or nine, what you see when you look at them, the scary thought is you don't see any fruit in their lives. You don't see them have any real thought for God and the decisions they make, and they've got no real desire to follow Him, and that God is secondary and you're wondering, maybe things aren't okay. Do you pretend maybe to others that you've got the perfect marriage, that home is happy, that everything's wonderful, but inside your own heart there's a deep dissatisfaction that things are not as they should be, but I don't want anybody to know that. Do you think that maybe others want to see you or you want others to see you as a really committed Christian? But the truth of the matter is you haven't been anywhere near where you need to be with God in a long time. And maybe it's beginning to, to, to weigh on you. What if we tolerate these kinds of lies at home? Because we know that if we address them, we're going to open a can of worms and spill everything out where it's going to be a mess. And to be quite honest, we're not really ready to clean up that kind of mess and address it yet. Do you know how this story ends? 
It ends where obviously Isaac is a man. He is a he's made an impulsive decision. He's 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 moving his family. He's making decisions out of fear in the midst of famine. Certainly, all these are factors in his life. He gets to where he's going, and now we know he's made a mistake because he's living out of fear, making decisions out of fear. He's lying. He's been he's he's got a terrible kind of testimony to now. What becomes obvious to everybody, he's a liar. And I mean, it, it all comes out. What makes things even worse is these people knew Isaac to be uh, the recipient of God's blessing and, and, and where he should have come in and been able to tell others about the glories of God. He's uh, Now nobody believes him. How could they? He's lied about the other things in his life. But do you know how this story ends? It ends in verse number 12. Here's what it says. It says, And the Lord blessed him. That's not how I saw this story wrapping up in my initial readings. We would expect that in this story, after all Isaac has done, and I know God hadn't given the commandment yet, but surely God still believed it was important. Thou shalt not take God's name in vain. Isaac would have never uh, taken a curse word and connected it with God's name. That's not really exactly what that passage is about. It's about calling yourself a follower of God, but you're displaying something completely different to the people around you. That's what Isaac has done. We would expect it, that God's righteous judgment would have fallen, that Isaac would have been disciplined, that he would have been, uh, that, that, that God would have whipped on him a little bit, and he'd have learned his lesson. But that's not at all what happens. Instead, verse 12 tells us that the Lord blessed him. And so even after all he's got wrong, there is this beautiful, gracious gift of God to him. And what you find is that Isaac may be a mess, but he was God's mess. This is the same story. Remember, this is the meta-narrative that a bunch of small stories are telling really the bigger story. You are going to see this same story of somebody God loves, of somebody that wants to follow God, but somebody who royally messes things up. You're going to see this story in a thousand different places in the Bible, played out in a thousand different decisions by a thousand different people. But what you're also going to find is it's going to be true for you too. There are going to be days when you mess it up, days when you blow it, days when you've told the lie or, or, or shown something that's not necessarily true. There are going to be days when you faked it too. But the rest of the Bible is going to tell us that even when you were in your sin, the gracious blessing of God was that He sent His only Son to bless you by dying for you and by rising from the dead three days later. And now he invites you in spite of your sin because he has become the sacrifice to make those sins forgiven as if they never happened. That even though you're the sinner, he invites you near because he took your place. It doesn't make sense logically. We're not used to anybody being this gracious to us. But that's what God does. I wonder if maybe you're looking at home and you're realizing you got problems there. Or maybe you're looking at your own heart and you're realizing that I've got major problems in my own heart. Maybe it is that you've realized that you're a sinner, but the mercy of God, the blessing of God, is that He's inviting you to repent of your sins and to place your faith in Him and to be saved and forgiven. I'm wondering this, do you need God to bless you by saving you, forgiving you, and moving on with you? the way he did with Isaac. At the very bottom of the screen in just a moment, you're going to see a very familiar email address. It's mynextstepphpc at gmail.com. And what we do with that email address is we invite you to contact us because we want to help you talk through where you are with God. It could be that this morning you're watching and maybe you know Jesus as your Savior. Uh, you, you know Him as Master and Lord, but, but you've, you've, become, you've kind of fallen under conviction over the fact that there's some lies in your own life that you're telling that you're showing, that you're wanting others to believe, they're not true. You got a whole life out there, you're, what you're showing people is not really what's going on in your life. Maybe today's the day where you repent and you get that stuff right. It could be that you're listening this morning, you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, but you'd like to. Let's do this. Let's take this moment, let's do what we would do in church. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you're listening this morning and you go, I need to make a decision for Jesus. 
And so right there where you are, just like we would do if we were in church, nobody's looking at you, nobody's messing with you, maybe right there on your couch or in your car or on your back deck, you go, okay, I'm ready to quit living the lie and I'm ready for Jesus to truly be my Savior. I'm ready to for real turn from my sins, repent, and to give my life completely to Jesus. Listen, if I were sitting where you were sitting, I, this is what I'd do. I'd bow my head right there and I'd turn away from my sins and I'd confess Jesus as Lord and I'd ask Him to save me. I'd pray something like this. I'd pray, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I don't want to live a lie. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that you are God's Son. I know you died for me and I know I need you. So today I turn from my sins. I repent. I give them up. I don't want them anymore, but I do want you, Jesus. From this moment on, I commit my life to you, and by faith, I trust you. Please save me. Please wash my sins away. I accept you as my Savior, and now I want to follow you for the rest of my life. I want you to look at me. If you prayed that or something like that, those words aren't magical. That's just what I would say if, if I was where you were, because it's, it's what I think I, I would want to do. It's what I have done. And so I wonder this, did you pray that or something like that? Or would you like to talk with somebody about praying something like that? Why don't you email me this morning, mynextstepphbc at gmail.com. I want to talk to you today about placing your faith in Christ. Let's not wait another day. Let's talk today. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to pray. I'm going to dismiss us. And after I pray, I want to remind you there's going to be some questions online for you to be able to study or talk with with your family, whatever that family looks like, a dorm room, a classroom, a, a, a living room, whatever it is, with your family, with your tribe. Why don't you discuss this and take it a little bit deeper today? Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. Father, I pray that you'd help us to see ourselves like you see us and that you'd show us the lies we're living, the lies we're telling, and the lies we're comfortable with. And may, Lord, we get right. I pray for those who need to give their heart to Jesus and are struggling with that. I pray that today they would, uh, they'd reach out and they'd, they'd give us an opportunity to talk with them and help them and that today they'd be ready to receive Jesus as their Savior. Father, please use us and bless us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, church family, we'll see you soon.